everyone, and welcome to Gruff Talk, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and age better. Before we dive in, just a quick reminder that you can subscribe to Gruff Talk on all podcast platforms, and you can find it on my website, barbarahannagrufferman.com, and on YouTube. Not sure where to look? Just do a Google search of Gruff Talk, How to Age Better with Barbara Hannah Grufferman, and it'll pop up and just click and listen and hopefully enjoy. If you have questions for me or suggestions for topics you want to see talked about on the show, email me at grufftalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to all of you who have sent us questions and topic ideas. They're also great. In fact, one of the emails we received is the topic of today's episode. Today, we're going to be talking with the queen of organization, Julie Morgenstern, about why we should declutter our lives as we get older so our kids aren't stuck doing it. I mean, do you really want them to have to deal with your late Aunt Bessie's collection of teacups that she left for you? I don't know. There's even a name for it in Sweden. I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but it's do standning. Do means death and standing means cleaning. A rough translation, death cleaning. Yep. Today we're talking about why you should shed your stuff before you die and how. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. By the time we hit 50, most of us have developed some kind of management system for our lives. We had to, right? I mean, how else could we balance school, work, playdates, doctor appointments, walking the dog, making dinner, shopping for groceries, washing laundry, paying bills, and working out, hopefully, and still find time for family and friends and fun? If we didn't have some kind of organizational skills, nothing would ever get done, right? Well, as organized as I was, though, when I turned 50, I was overwhelmed by the stuff that had accumulated over the years. And I realized that it wasn't just the physical clutter, but mental clutter, too. I looked around at everything and started to feel paralyzed and really, really stuck. The more clutter there was, the more stuck I felt. And it was stopping me from moving forward. And that's when I heard Julie Morgenstern on the radio. Julie is a New York Times bestselling author, internationally known organization consultant, and time management expert. She's the author of six best-selling books, and she consults with very large corporations and speaks, goes all over the country speaking about these things. She's appeared on Oprah, The Today Show, Fresh Air from, on, on NPR, and she's helped thousands of people transform their homes, businesses, and attitudes about every kind of clutter. She's also written columns for many magazines like O Magazine, Red Book, Forbes, and even Thrive Global, helping readers solve problems by inspiring order in their lives. On the radio that day, Julie was talking about life transitions, feeling stuck, managing change, and decluttering your life to make room for your future, your future. She said that you shouldn't even try organizing anything until you've gone through a process called shedding. Organizing is great and useful, of course, she said, but to assume you can just tidy up what you have without thinking about why you have it and what you really want is setting yourself up for failure. It just won't work. I met Julie to learn how to shed my stuff and to interview her for my first book. Her advice was life-changing. I put everything I learned from Julie into constant and regular practice and still do. And I've gotten really good at organizing and managing my things, my obligations, my life. But when my mother passed away in 2021, on top of the grieving, I was also overwhelmed by having to take care of all her stuff, the paperwork, clothes, the dishes, well, every single thing. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. Turns out there is a better way. <laughs> and it's called Swedish death cleaning. Uh huh. This became world famous when a lovely older woman, an artist from Sweden, wrote about it, and the book became an international bestseller. In fact, it's being turned into a TV show by NBC and Amy Poehler in the fall, where Swedish death cleaners, as they're called, help people to deal with their stuff before they die so their kids and other loved ones don't have to. 
So a few weeks ago, I got an email from a listener, which is really pretty funny, a little spooky, who wanted to hear an episode that focuses on when and how to put your things in order, as she put it, so her kids don't have to. While she made it clear that she didn't feel she was leaving this earth anytime soon, (laughs) she really wanted a push to get started because she too had been so overwhelmed by her mother's recent death, followed by having to make decisions about all the things she left behind. And she didn't want her own kids to have that experience. So I thought, "Mm mm-hmm, yep, this is something to talk about. And the first person I called was Julie Morgenstern and invited her on the show to guide us on how to, mm, how should we say, get our things in order sooner rather than later. Let's begin. Hello, Julie, and welcome to Gruff Talk. It's great to be with you, Barbara. Thanks for having me. We have a lot to cover and a very important subject that uh, people really don't want to talk too much about, but we're going to make them talk about it today, or at least we're going to make them think about it today. So, all right, Julie, one of the most important lessons I learned when I was going through my aha moment when I turned 50 and I was lost and really didn't know what I was doing, like a lot of us, and I started researching topics and talking to experts like you to write my first book. And that, that the best lesson at, from that time was from you because it was a fundamental truth. And here it is. You can't move forward if you're stuck where you are. It's amazing. Such a simple thing, but so powerful. And this can really be applied to literally anything in life. And as we know, life after 50, primarily life after 50, can throw a lot of things your way that can make you feel stuck, right? And that's because life after 50 is also all about change. That's something else I learned from you. And a lot of it we're just not ready for. A lot of it is not in our own making. It's just thrown at us. So you have this amazing process, as you call it, that you call Shed. In fact, it was the name of uh, one of your great books. And uh, so I want to start the conversation talking about Shed, what it is, and what the whole process is. So if you can talk us through that, please. Yeah, sure. So Shed is a process for eliminating the obsolete in your life so that you have the energy and the clarity and the freedom to move forward. And it's very different than organizing. And I always want to sort of define the distinctions because a lot of times people have a lot of stuff around them like, oh, I have to get organized or I have to throw things out. Organizing is creating a system that gives you access to what you use and love. It's where you are. You're setting up camp for where you are. Decluttering is identifying what is obsolete and releasing it so you can move forward. And it's a four-step process to be really mechanical about. If you think of the word SHED as an acronym for the steps of how you deal with what we define as clutter, which is stuff that's no longer relevant in your life, not usable, S-H-E-D. So S is for separate the treasures, which means you never go in and just categorically throw everything out. That's when you regret Mm -hmm. something. Even if it's driving you crazy and you don't want to face it, don't just dump everything. You want to separate the treasures, what is really valuable and relevant still. H is heave the rest. (laughs) That means get it out. (laughs) Don't just have it in your garage now for the next 10 years. Like get it out of your space. Including selling or donating or giving. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or throwing out. Mm -hmm. Or throwing out. Mm -hmm. We'll get into more details of the complexities of that part for people. E is for embrace your identity from within. And that is really interesting because we get so attached our identity to our stuff. And especially at this age, after 50, like you've built a life for yourself and you've acquired things and some things you really love and some things are just sort of there, but they remind you of a time and... Or of somebody else. Or somebody else. Exactly. And we can be lost when that stuff is gone. It's like, who am I without that stuff? 
Who am I without all those piles? Who am I without all those clothes that I haven't worn in 30 years, but they Mm -hmm. remind me of my like pre-married self or whatever, my early days. My disco days. (laughs) That was going through my mind, by the way. (laughs) So it's really important to recognize that decluttering is not just a mechanical it's really a very emotional process. And after you release things, you have to embrace your identity from within, which is you are who you are without all those objects. You're the one who acquired them. It came from inside you. You chose them. So your identity is internal, really. Objects can be reminders, but they are not your identity. Your identity comes from within. And then D is drive yourself forward, which is really to move into this lightened up life with energy and enthusiasm. Again, it can be tricky based on what you said, which is if it's an unwelcome change, you may not be skipping along to the future. Mm. But there are ways to shift your perspective on that and to really make, you know, bring a lot of energy around it and that it's nurturing and not you know, a loss, but it's a gain. You know what else I learned from you? I learned so much at that time and continue to learn from you with your, you know, videos and on your website and the like, but that things are more than just physical things. Things are also people, which is a physical thing, but it could be people who may not bring you joy anymore in your life, might be in fact a joy sucker. Uh, It could be obligations, things that you're just so used to doing and you feel obligated to continue to do, but aren't really working for you anymore and are just really sucking all the time out of your life and and your day. So that's something else too. Like we we don't think about those things. It's like when you're shedding, it's not just about physical thing, like a teapot, No, no, but it's other things. So I think of clutter, like I kind of bucket into three broad categories of clutter. There's physical clutter, which is objects that you can see and touch. There's schedule clutter, which is really obligations in your calendar that like, you know, for years you have been volunteering on some board or some, and it was fun for the first few years, but 10 years later, you dread every meeting. That's schedule clutter. Mm -hmm. And then there's habit clutter. And habit Mm -hmm. clutter are habits that we'd acquired that maybe worked for us at some point or didn't harm us so much at some point, but now (laughs) are really weighing us down like chronic lateness or procrastination that are really weighing us down. It no longer works for us and we need to shed that old habit to make space for a more positive today. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the life events that, you know, we all experience or see our friends and family experience during midlife that really creates this challenge of feeling stuck because all of these changes are taking place and you need to start thinking about shedding. Yeah. Everything that you just described, what are some of those life events? I mean, you know, in your fifties and above, it could be anything from Kids empty nesting is a really common one. Leaving a lot of stuff, may I add. <laughs> Leaving a lot of stuff? What do you mean? They leave their own stuff when they oh, yeah. leave. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the they leave other stuff, their stuff in, the, in their rooms <laughs> that you have to deal with. That Yeah. So empty nesting, divorcing, moving. I mean, if you decide after the kids are gone and they've been gone for a while, like we don't need this big house anymore and getting into a smaller home, illness. I mean, illness is, you know, a trigger. It's a big one. And if you lose your energy or your capacities in certain ways, you may need to really simplify your space to make it easier to operate in, to match your energy level. Divorce, maybe we mentioned divorce, death of a loved one. Yeah, I mean, death of a loved great. one. And uh, and actually, that is uh, what we're going to be segueing into because, mm-hmm. you know, your tools are just incredible to use for the individual person who's really feeling stuck in life or whatever the reason is, for it could be any of those reasons, could be all of those reasons that you've just mentioned, but they're feeling stuck and they just 
but like inertia has said, and they don't know what to do. So your tools will really help them. But what I want to talk about next is taking those valuable tools Mm -hmm. that you share with us and using them to help other loved ones, your children, your other loved ones, your family who may have to end up dealing with all of your stuff someday. All right. So that's the best way to put it. So after this very short break, we'll talk about something that people really, really don't want to talk about, but really, really need to. Yes. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back with my very special guest, Julie Morgenstern, who is one of the world's leading experts on the importance of organization, why we must shed our stuff, how to do it, and really the subject of today's conversation is when, like when, when is a good time to really start thinking about shedding that stuff? So, Julie, let's segue, all right, as I said before, let's segue on to something that has been on my mind a lot since my mother passed away in 2021. What we had been talking about was how to declutter to make room for you, an individual, to forge ahead, to get unstuck, right? To move on with life. But now I want to talk about another aspect of decluttering that is such an a common, common challenge. I'm shocked at how many people are discussing this with me lately. Yeah. When my mother passed away, it was left to me to declutter the things, the papers, the photos, everything, the pots and pans, the linen, everything. I have spoken with several friends recently who were handling the stuff their parents or parent left behind. In addition to the grief, my mind right now is going to a very dear friend in London who just told me the other day that she has not done a single thing with her parents' things, not the house, not the things in the house, nothing. And she has the added burden of being in London while all of the stuff, the house and the things are in South Africa. So this is also very common. We don't always live in the same town as our parents. We could be living across the country, across the world for that matter. So on top of a geographical distance, the grief that comes with losing a parent or parents Mm -hmm. and while still trying to carry on with your own life. So it made me think, I don't want that. (laughs) I personally do not want that for my children to have to deal with. So I started to kind of think about this. And my goal with this part of our conversation is to motivate everyone to give serious, serious thought to something called... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe you could have a happier name. I don't know. But Swedish death cleaning, starting yeah. with Julie, what the heck is Swedish death cleaning and why has it become such a known word or words around the world? Can you explain to us what this is? Yeah. So Swedish death cleaning, which is a kind of a morbid term, I agree, it could be <laughs> branded a little bit better, but it's basically thinking ahead exactly what you're talking about and saying, I'm going to declutter now so that I am not leaving. What I leave is really thoughtful. It's intentional. It's manageable and it's valuable to the people who I'm leaving it to and all the other stuff I'm releasing to not give the burden of time or decision-making to others, make the decisions yourself and really lighten that load. It's thinking ahead. You know, what are you going to do with all this stuff in your house when you're gone? Nothing. Yeah. And so what are some of the, the best ways? Uh, there is a book that came out, by the way, from Sweden, yeah. which is what made this a household term in the last couple of years. An artist, an elderly woman, I think she says she's somewhere between 80 and 100. <laughs> lovely, lovely little book with some drawings that she herself did. Uh, I mentioned she's an artist and she you know, kind of made this uh, something we should all think about. And she wanted to present it in the way that was not morose, that was not depressing or sad, but like, uh, you know, let's look at everything. Let's look at everything that you have and maybe now start to ask 
your loved ones and family and friends, do you want this? Do you want this? Oh, I see you're moving into a new apartment. Do you want this? Kind of yeah. start to think about it, but then even going deeper than that, you know, yeah. deeper in that, like really starting to throw out things yeah. that, you know, like, you know, do your kids really want Aunt Bessie's teapot? that yeah. she left to you that you didn't even want, <laughs> yeah. for example. So what are some of the, the tools yeah. that you share with us? So how can we apply this to Swedish death cleaning? Maybe there's a better American term for it. Uh, so I think first is <laughs> Getting to, your things in order. That's it. Yeah. First is to but motivate us to do it, right? Which mm -hmm. is the first thing, because I always think mindset is like the key that turns us into behavior. It's not just doing it. So think about it in a couple of different ways. You think about the stuff that is around you. you do think about what is the time and emotional burden that you are going to leave to your loved ones, whether that is your children or your nieces or nephew or brother or sister. If it is too daunting for you now, Imagine the burden it is for somebody else who is going to be missing you and have it not any way of knowing what was really valuable to you and what was just a piece of junk. And all of us know when we have inherited an unsorted set of belongings or an estate, you don't know and you want to honor that person, but like which of these really mattered and which didn't. So think about that burden. And if it's too much for you, multiply that burden by 10, 20, 30, 100 to a loved one who now has to do that. So that's the one motivation. I think the second motivation is to curate what people see. Because when you're gone, what do you want people to know about you or to see about you or to like, this art really mattered and this pottery that I got in Corsica <laughs> was really special. And what is stuff that you just don't want them to see? So, or just, it's, it's meaningless to you. It's just your, it's daunting and it's time consuming to do all this stuff. So it's a gift. It's a gift both to yourself and to your loved ones. And I think the other thing to really keep in mind is to look around and you can do this in layers because mm -hmm. Ask yourself, is everything in my home something that I use and love? Mm -hmm. Or is it just stuff that's been sitting around and I haven't had the energy or the will to like make those decisions? And if the first layer is to declutter every piece of thing that is like obsolete, you don't use it, you don't love it, get those things out first. And then you may end up with a house full of things you use and love. And even that is going to be difficult for somebody to just have to make decisions on. But that's when you can start to say, this art means so much to me. Do you want it? This pottery collection is so great. Can you use it? And to do it while you're alive. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you a little story. My mother has done this. My mom, who's still around, has done this. And she, <laughs> all four of us, the kids... And her grandchildren are like, grandma, we don't want, she's like, I want, do you want this? And she's like emptying her apartment practically. And we're like, we could just have our name on it. And then we don't even want to think about when you go, but like, we don't want to oh, take it now. It's so depressing. And all of us had this resistance. And she's like, mm. no, I would rather see you take it while I'm alive. And then I personally was very resistant. I was like, mom, it's fine. Like, I don't need that now. And she was like, no, take it. She made us all come down and take stuff. And Barbara, I have to say- That was a wonderful story, Julie. Really? Oh, I love her. And she, that's amazing that she did that. She should write a book. Take your stuff off. <laughs> you and she should write a book about this. It's great. Here's a picture. Take it off the wall. Like, you have an empty spot. She said, I'll move this one over there. This one, no one wants. It goes in the hole on the wall. And I, the things that I took, I will tell you, I just didn't want much because I don't want a whole bunch of clutter, but my parents had this Tevia statue that really represented oh my dad. Oh my gosh. I want that so much. 
So I took the Tevye statue. Everyone always said, Julie, the Tevye is yours because I, you know, <laughs> in my soul. Yeah. There yeah, was yeah. my grandmother's pickle jar that came from the Ukraine when she came over. I wanted that oh because gosh. that reminded me one thing that reminded me of my grandmother. And then there was a brass mortar and pestle also that came from the old country. And then I got some one thing was my mom had this like really beautiful ceramic bowl and pitcher for hand washing. And I just thought it was beautiful and it was new ish. She probably got it in the last like eight years, but she was like, take it, take it, take it. And I was like, I like it. Okay. So the thing is I was resistant. I was like, this is depressing. I don't want to take it now. She's like, take it. I took it. And now I have it. The joy that I feel seeing those things in my home, knowing they're not reminding me of my dead mother. Mm -hmm. It's like energy between us. It's like, she knows I have them. I have them. I'm like, oh, it's so great to see Tevya here on this shelf. When she comes to visit, she's going to see it and it's going to bring her joy. So that's the story. I mean, it's a, it's. That's a, that's a wonderful story and a lesson for everyone tuning in about you know, accepting, I don't want to say taking, accepting things that your loved ones have while they're still living. I think that's just so lovely. And you're right. It does bring you joy and it'll bring her joy when she sees them being used and loved and cared for. But, you know, you did say something else too, while you were telling this really charming story is that you had suggested, hey, let's just put our names on everything. Because that that is getting back to the practical aspect of doing this process. That is something you can do. I mean, we're not suggesting that everyone clear out their homes. You know, we're assuming you still have many years ahead of you, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. I mean, that's the hope. But you may want to, with things like what you just described, you may want to like put them in your will then, you know, assign names to the things with or without their involvement. But that's the point. It's part of the organization process of getting your, your things in order. Yes. While you still can. And I think that that's the message here. While Mm -hmm. you still can do it. And to make it not, you know, You're also removing the burden of that decision between loved ones. Do you want it or do you want it? I mean, it's just, you know, you Mm -hmm. like not every sibling gets along. And even if they do, then it's like, it's hard. These are hard things. And if you can do it through conversation while you're alive and it it really can remove a very big burden and give them a piece of you that they want. Right. It's, it it's alleviates stress, I think, among, you know, everybody and will make it less, less of a, a sad, sad thing and more of a joyful thing. Yeah. I see only good things coming out of this process. I really, really do. And I just encourage everyone to do it. I know I am, like I mentioned, I have been thinking about this. I haven't actually started to do it, but I am doing it. And this is like a little bit of an accountability thing. Maybe I'll come back and report. We'll have you back on in like six months and, and I'll give you a report. <laughs> how far I'm and gone. I will do one other thing, which is important because I've coached people who are going through this also, who are trying to make these decisions, sometimes triggered by like illness or someone in this family is sick and they're starting to think about this. Mm-hmm. Or the recent loss of a loved one, as with me, what triggered it for me was the loss of my mother only within the past year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as you look, and if you're thinking about, you know, your kids or whoever's going to inherit stuff or the job to declutter your house or your home, the other thing is think about the benefit to you. If most of us only use about 20% of what we own in any given category. 20%. 20%. You wear the same 20% of your clothes over and over again. You use the same 20% of your pots and pans and lids over and over again. Mm-hmm. We use about 20%. Imagine one of the things that comes with being older is you're older, you're wiser, you have a little bit more freedom. You're not burdened by like, I have to take care of the kids. And I, you know, you're, you're lighter in certain ways. You have certain freedoms. What would it be like if your home 
instead of thinking about what you're getting rid of, you think about like diving for treasures. What's my 20%? And that you get rid of the 80%, whether you give it away or you donate it or whatever it is that you do, give it to loved ones. For you to surround yourself at this age of your life with the 20% everywhere you look is stuff you use and love. Yeah. And there's empty space on shelves and empty spots in where it's not overstuffed, which opens up possibility and energy in your space. That's a gift to yourself too. Yes. Wow. I, you know energy. what, Julie, that was brilliant. And that's a great way of starting this whole process yeah. is you're right. We all, and I think during the pandemic, I used even less than 20%, quite frankly. And I think a lot of us did too, when we were all stuck home. I mean, getting rid of the other 80% and just keeping for starters, the 20% that's most important to you is a great way to begin this process. Yeah. And then take it from there and then maybe start assigning, you know, ownership of all of the 20% in time Yeah, as part of your process, as your personal process. Yeah, yeah. No, it's brilliant. And if you've inherited stuff from somebody who died, who left it all to you, ask the same question. And maybe it's not even what 20% of their stuff really means the most to me. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's 10%. Maybe it's 5%. The truth mm-hmm. is, if objects remind us of people who were important to us, who were in our lives, who we loved, how many of those objects do you need to trigger that feeling? Exactly. Exactly. And we haven't even gotten to other things like that are very, very tricky to deal with, which we'll have to save for another time, like photos, letters, things like that. Like, oh my gosh, what do you do with all those photos, boxes and boxes? You know, now we're all digital, but back in the day, they were all physical. Yeah. And we all have those photos stored in some boxes somewhere. No question about it. Julie, this was so, so helpful. Everything you said was incredibly helpful. And I especially love, it's really resonating with me, that 20%. Like I, I'm a very visual thinker and I'm just picturing my favorite 20% of my stuff Yeah, as the place for me to start. So really, really great. So we'll have links to everything about you, Julie on uh, you know, your website, your books, and everything that you're doing, that you have been doing, that you are doing, will be doing in the show notes and also on my website, barbarahannagrufferman.com. But before we say goodbye, could you please just give, we just talked about a lot of stuff, but can you give the Gruff Talk audience three powerful takeaways from today's conversation? Yeah. I would say takeaway number one is to recognize that purging and decluttering your life now is a gift to the people you love and a gift to yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, it does not have to be depressing. It can be an uplifting, energizing act. Two, I would say start by identifying your 20% in every category in your home of stuff that you really use and love and energizes you and then start figuring out what you can do with the rest. But start with what you're going to really keep that you truly treasure. And the third thing, which we didn't say, but I would say now is start small. Start in one category, not one room, Barbara, one category, because we declutter by category, not room in the house. Mm -hmm. Like all your clothes. Or all, all your all pots your and pans. That's, a, that's great. We do think more of rooms, don't we? Yeah, but don't do rooms because you mm-hmm. don't have context. It's what's my 20% in this category of books. And I have books in four rooms in my house. I still want the 20% of the full collection. Pots and pans, some are in the basement, some are in the kitchen. What's my 20%? And because that's what you're trying to do. So always declutter by category, not by room and do one category at a time. That's brilliant. That's so great. Julie, thank you so much. You will come back. I want to hear back. about my, my uh, progress with my process. Yes, I do. <laughs> I want to hear. <laughs> thank you again, Julie. Right. Really appreciate your coming on. Thanks, Barbara. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Rough Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family and subscribe to Rough Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.